We turn now to Silicon Valley and one of its most influential investors. Venture capitalist Peter Thiel had a hand in the success of many of the most profitable tech companies from today, from Facebook to SpaceX. He's also on a quest to live forever, investing millions in life extension research. It's all down on paper in Max Chapkin's new biography, The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. Here he is speaking with Hari Srinivasan about the man behind the money. Biana, thanks. Max Chafkin, thanks so much for joining us. You call Peter Thiel the most influential venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Why? Well, Peter Thiel um, it has been behind some of the most important companies in Silicon Valley. So he's the co-founder of PayPal. He's the founder of Palantir, which is this gigantic uh, defense contractor data mining firm that has you know, more than a billion dollars in contracts from the U.S. government. And probably most significantly, he is the, the first outside investor and the longest serving board member at Facebook. He is really the person who kind of made Mark Zuckerberg Mark Zuckerberg, who both set Facebook up with this structure that allows Zuckerberg to control the company um, basically as a de facto dictator. You know, he controls the board of directors. He's the founder. He's the CEO. And he also kind of created this as a sort of ideology, which has spread throughout Silicon Valley. And you see this structure and also kind of the Facebook approach to growth, which Peter Thiel really helped create, having kind of um, been deployed across the tech industry and has led to a lot of the tech industry's, you know, amazing success over the last few years, but also I think some of the, the problems. Most people in America, if they know of him, they might have caught a glimpse of him during the Republican National Convention when he was on stage and he was endorsing Donald Trump. But, you know, you point out that that would be kind of an oversimplic oversimplification of his politics. I mean, what is it that got him to that point? Yeah, so that this is what makes Teal so interesting and probably, you know, it's like why I was interested in, in writing about him for this book, because he's not just this tech guy, this guy who's kind of helped create Silicon Valley as it exists today, but he's had this really interesting and, and really long, decades-long career in conservative politics. Um, he got attention, you know, way back as, as the 1980s, starting this newspaper called the Stanford Review, which is kind of a provocative right-wing newspaper, really similar to sort of the Dartmouth Review, which was, you know, Dinesh D'Souza's paper, Cornell Review, which Ann Coulter was involved with. And, you know, he wrote a book about, you know, the dangers of, quote-unquote, multiculturalism um, in the uh, mid 90s, he's sort of always flirted with this kind of very provocative, this idea that the liberal establishment has gone too far, and and you know, and and these and conservatives need to push back, and and I think he really saw an opportunity with Donald Trump, who made that you know a core part of his candidacy, and and of course Teal, who is sort of a brilliant investor, um, is always one to spot an opportunity to, to buy low, you know, got in um, sort of on the Trump campaign, uh, the Trump train, as it were, really early, you know, making this, making uh, his support known before most in the business world had gotten behind Trump, and then making a donation, you know, at a really crucial time during the 2016 election, shortly after the Access Hollywood tape had leaked. And, and many Republicans, and especially in the donor class, were writing off Trump's candidacy. You know, you mentioned that early on in his life, some of his, uh, one of his colleagues or one of his uh, co-workers had said that he was saying, you know what, the, the entire political system is all corrupt. And here he is playing this like a chess game, which you say he's very good at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there is this um, strain of kind of ultra libertarian. I mean, it's, 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 it's like a real bring down the system kind of, um, ethos that you see in Teal and also many of the people who have who have come into positions of power in the tech industry. And that's kind of, again, that's, I think, why he's so interesting, because it's not, he's not just this singular figure. He's somebody who, whose ideas have, have proliferated. In, in the early, uh, sorry, the late 90s, you know, when Teal started PayPal, we think of PayPal as being this um, you know, money transfer thing. It's a way to buy stuff on eBay. Um, and it is that. But but back then, Teal was talking about it as a the kind of culmination of this libertarian project. He talked about, you know, this would be a way to let anyone have a Swiss bank account in their pocket, that it would um, hurt the the viability of nation states. You know, these are super radical statements, that you, and now you've seen them cro cropping up actually, you know, in the in the world of crypto today, um, and, and and they've really you know gone mainstream to some extent. But of course, they're they're also kind of in conflict with with some aspects of Donald Trump and Trumpism because. 
Trump is, you know, he's a nationalist and it's all about, you know, America first. So, so you know, Teal is kind of a, a, a swirl of contradictions at times, but, but has really been, you know, at, you know, had these like really radical philosophies. It, it, tell us a little bit more about those contradictions, because as you point out, I mean, on the one hand, the libertarian wants small government, and on the other hand, his company is supporting the CIA and Homeland Security and many other government agencies. Yeah, I don't think Thiel is like a libertarian in, in any kind of normal sense. He definitely supports some libertarian goals, such as, you know, um, the idea that billionaires should be allowed to pay less in taxes and that, you know, businesses should be allowed, you know, increasing freedom, you know, bordering on the freedom to kind of run um, the world. Um, but Thiel has also been, you know, really far right on immigration, you know, kind of really in line with, with Donald Trump and Trumpism on immigration. And I think when you um, kind of add all this stuff up, um, one possible explanation is he's, you know, he's just adopted a lot of um, extreme positions that that have allowed him to enrich himself. I mean, uh, the 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 libertarian position, of course, um, is a great way to pay less in taxes. Um, his affinity with the Trump administration um, has been a really great, uh, arguably a really great asset to Palantir, his, his uh, defense contractor that has won, as I said, you know, um, uh, more than a billion dollars in contracts uh, since since 2016. You know, the, as you read the book, it's like he's almost like a Forrest Gump-like character. He shows up in all of these moments in the lives of these tech companies and these entrepreneurs, which turn out to be pivotal, and they turn out to be huge. I mean, uh, most people don't know that there was a company called X.com that Elon Musk was running, which was literally in the same building down the hallway from Peter Thiel's company. Uh, you know, he and Elon Musk at one point both were CEOs of PayPal. So they don't seem like they would get along. No, and, and they don't get along because uh, there was a there was a big blow up. I mean, this this is uh, there's so many crazy stories, and I love the the Forrest Gump analogy because like he, he, it really is that way. I mean, following Teal is sort of this alternative path through the history of Silicon Valley. You know, Musk and Teal. Um, have this have a relationship. Sometimes it's a friendship, but sometimes it's it's more of a rivalry. Um, and in 1999 and 2000, you know, they're both running these competing payments companies. The two companies merged. Musk took over and uh, was running the company. And he was, you know, the better known of the two men. He had more uh, investment dollars, more famous investors. He was in many ways a senior partner. And Peter Thiel, you know, being kind of a master chess player, and he was, you know, he was a, a chess champion as a boy, or, you know, engineers this coup where where Musk flies to um, to Australia for his honeymoon, and I, I think he maybe had a few investor meetings uh, planned along the way. And when he comes back, he finds that the that the these um, allies of Peter Thiel's have gone to Mike Moritz, who's the most one of the most famous investors in Silicon Valley, and presented him with an ultimatum, which says either replace Elon Musk with Peter Thiel or we walk. And the amazing thing about that story is not just that Peter Thiel, you know, did a coup on Elon Musk, you know, the two of the most famous people in Silicon Valley, but that after that happened, they managed to kind of patch it up. And if you know anything about Elon Musk, he does not take slights lightly, but it's really a comment on both Thiel's, but really on Thiel's power that Musk saw that, you know, he was, he'd, be, he'd be better off with, with Peter Thiel as a friend than as an enemy. And, and years later, when Musk's um, rocket company was struggling in 2008. It had had a couple of unsuccessful launches. Prospects look really dim. Peter Thiel comes along and makes an investment in SpaceX that helps save Elon Musk's rocket company. And I would argue helps save Elon Musk's you know business empire really because because he was in a very difficult place. And and if so, of course, that and that's just like another one of these weird influences that Thiel's managed to have. You know, not only over his friends but uh, over these people who you know he's he's had one over on. So uh, tell me a little bit about how it is that he becomes the first big backer of Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, so Teal is the leader. You, if you if you spend time in Silicon Valley, you'll hear this phrase, PayPal Mafia. That's the that's the group of former PayPal executives, uh, basically led by Peter Teal. And after the uh, after eBay purchased uh, PayPal, they sort of went off into Silicon Valley and started working together, making investments, basically in each other's companies and companies of friends. And you'll see employees bouncing from one company to the next. The network is not. Uh, you know, it's, it's 
called a mafia, but it's it's not a violent network. But it is a network where loyalty and 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 both in terms of business loyalty, but at times kind of ideological loyalty. A lot of these guys have kind of the same politics. Really is valued, and 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 that loyalty also includes, of course, not talking to the press, which um, was made in my life a little bit difficult. Um, Zuckerberg comes to Teal through that network, through this guy Reed Hoffman, who was a a, a senior executive at uh, PayPal, who then founded LinkedIn, and 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 he had this meeting with Zuckerberg, and you know at the time Zuckerberg really didn't look like much, right? He'd been sort of um, run into trouble at Harvard. He was this kind of bad boy who'd done something vaguely, you know, not criminal, but but certainly not following the rules. And 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 Teal is somebody who kind of loves these these people, loves these provocateurs, these guys who who get in trouble uh, at elite institutions like Harvard, and sees you know very quickly not only that Zuckerberg you know was onto something, but that but that Facebook had a lot of potential, and and he helps Zuckerberg develop a strategy which is this kind of you know it's like the Roman emperor empire. You know Zuckerberg tried to grow as quickly as possible, as fast as possible to dominate this network um, that you know that. That is Facebook, and ultimately, of course, succeeded. You know, three billion users. I think it's um, you know fair to say that Facebook is the most powerful you know media company in in human history. Well, what's intriguing to me is what were the effects that Peter Thiel had beyond just the investment of cash into Mark Zuckerberg? Because in a way, you see some similarities in them: how they think of the world, where they think of their product, what they think is the acceptable and not acceptable reach of government. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's and that's why Teal matters because he's not it's not just a money man because if it was just a question of money, you know, he 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 isn't that rich. You know, he has maybe 10 billion dollars, maybe a little bit less. Um, yeah, I'm saying rich compared to, you know, the Jeff Bezos or something or Zuckerberg. Um, but he did create this business philosophy and and the philosophy is basically, you know, the philosophy of disruption. It's it's the idea that Companies should grow as big as possible, as quickly as possible. Teal talks about monopoly not as you know something to be avoided, you know, as, which is kind of how most capitalists um, think about it, but as the end point of business, the thing that all entrepreneurs should should strive for, which is a really you know radical kind of far out there suggestion. And he also talks you know at some length about the importance of bending the rules, of of of, of breaking norms. And it's not just that the norms. Um, it's not just that breaking the rules is something that happens incidentally, where you know you're uh, you accidentally run afoul of the law. It's almost that doing so is a good thing, it, and and that it, it it creates some virtue. And I think that is something that we've definitely seen kind of play out over and over again, um, not just with Facebook, but with many of these big companies. And there's also a lot of movement right now to try and regulate big tech. And interestingly, Peter Thiel is putting money behind some of the very candidates that could threaten, for example, well, him sitting on the board of Facebook, right, which, which would be a big tech company that would be squarely in the radars of Congress if this kind of thing passed. Um, he's backing these two Senate candidates, one in Arizona and one in Ohio, and they are both turning, you know, Mark Zuckerberg into a political punching bag. So I think it, it, it's it's an interesting question to ask. You know, why is he still on the board of Facebook? And and I think um, there there are a couple of different possible explanations. But but one thing he's been able to do on the board of Facebook is kind of nudge Mark Zuckerberg um, in the in this political direction, in the direction of, as conservatives see it, you know, not discriminating, quote unquote, against conservative worldviews. And, and of course, being on the Facebook board, you know, is an important position of influence and power. During the Trump administration, he was able to kind of serve as this broker between Mark Zuckerberg and Donald Trump, arguably like the two most powerful people in the world or two of the most powerful people in the world. Teal's personal wealth has also come into the spotlight recently. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with what an IRA is or a Roth IRA. I mean, we sock away a little bit every month if we can. And his account has billions of dollars in it and all of the profits that it's making will be tax free. How did we get to that? Yeah, so that's so that is a quirk of the Roth IRA, which is this kind of really not a pretty much little noticed investment um, kind of a investment account that was created in the '90s. You used uh, post-tax dollars, and any gains are tax-free. And 
as originally created, the Roth was for kind of middle class and lower middle class taxpayers. This was not supposed to have like a huge impact on, you know, on, on the IRS's ability to collect tax receipts, especially not tax receipts from billionaires. Um, but Teal, you know, very savvy operator, you know, you know, an incredible, you know, it's just like a, a brilliant chess player sort of figured out that there's this quirk, which is that startup founders can get shares at a very low price, at, you know, low enough so that he was able to acquire a significant chunk of PayPal inside of his Roth IRA while still not violating the rules around contribution limits, because the contribution limits at the time were just $2,000 a year. Um, and that money you know, grew enormously. And he eventually used some of those gains to buy shares in Palantir, you know, founding shares in Palantir, and to buy shares in Facebook, and probably uh, to buy shares in other companies. And so he now has this enormous nest egg, you know, uh, at least $5 billion as of 2019. It's probably quite a bit bigger um, now. And, and, and according to the tax rules as they're written, um, and, and if the interpretations of the way that Teal did this, you know, don't change, he's never going to pay taxes on that. And that I think is, I mean, it's depending on your point of view, again, it's, it's an outrage. It's a, it's a, it's a case of, you know, kind of oligarchic behavior or, you know, from Peter Thiel's fans though, of course, who, who think number one, that the system is broken. Number two, that billionaires should be allowed more leeway. It's something to be applauded. It's, it's like he got one over on, on the tax man and we've seen this structure has been copied by lots of other people. So, you know, people are talking about reforming it um, and, and there are bills in Congress that could affect Teal's, you know, tax liability. There are also chip shifts, again, in, in how they interpret these rules that could potentially impact Teal. But but it's not just Teal who would be affected. It'd be like a whole bunch of very, very angry Silicon Valley billionaires. Um, so it would be a formidable fight if it happens. It's evident from reading the book that you spent a lot of time reading his articles, articles from the Stanford Review, uh, lectures that he's given and so forth. And he's a pretty f famously private person. And I wonder what sort of cooperation or lack thereof there was in sitting down with him for the book. Yeah. So I approached this project, you know, journalistically, um, meaning I, I tried to talk to anyone who had um, worked at his companies, who had who knew him well, his friends, his former classmates, and of course Peter Thiel himself. And and I approached you know his his PR people early on in the process, and and we had a lot of back and forth. And there was ultimately an off the record meeting uh, with Peter Thiel, uh, but he did not he did not comment on the record. And that's kind of in keeping with his general position towards the press, which is he's he's kept the press kind of at arm's length. He has tried to you know, I think it's fair to say manipulate the press in various ways, both in terms of positive, you know, sort of positive manipulation, creating this image of a, you know, this, this Ayn Randian Superman, and also, of course, the, the, the sort of more, what you might think of as negative manipulation in terms of his, you know, long running battle against Gawker. The book is called The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. Max Jeffking, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.